What is up, everybody? Welcome to another live Pin the Gas podcast on this Friday afternoon. And listen, you guys, I've been so excited about this one. It's an absolute honor to sit down with the legend himself and my friend, Paul McKee, bro. What is up? What's up, brother? Good to see you, man. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks for absolutely. having me on. Oh, listen, the honor's all mine. Absolute honor's all mine. So, yeah, me, uh, we, we actually had a good chat for shoot like over an hour the other day uh yeah. testing and tuning so everything was working correctly when we did this but yeah bro it's been an absolute honor and uh yeah i want to get into it paul yeah. so listen where does your story begin from the very beginning uh how did you get into motorcycles uh one of my earliest memories would have been burning my leg on my dad's honda 750 in the driveway so uh, there was a long gap between that memory and getting back on a bike. Uh, my dad put him away when he became, you know, uh, a father for the second time. So just life changed things. But he was never a racer. He he rode, but he was never that big into bikes. Um, so there was a long period from there until I picked up bikes again, which uh, my buddy Seth, we were, I don't remember what got us in the mood to get a bike, but it hit me and I, I looked on Craigslist, you know, sought one out, bought, found me a deal in Georgia. So I uh, rode over, picked that up. And the next day he went and got him a brand new R6. So uh, we were, we were out on the back roads, not too long after that, living the dream. <laughs> living the dream. And what was the first bike you got? A uh, Ninja 500. Like, uh, I think it was actually, they still called it the EX at that point. It was like a 93, but it was sharp. Had, and I still got it. Uh, I have trouble letting go of any bikes. You know, once I ride them a little bit, they're pretty much um, in the family. So I've still got it here in the house. It was, had a black paint job with a nice red custom stripe going down the side. So it was, it was all the bike I needed. It was a good starter bike for sure. Oh, absolutely. You know, a lot of people... I think uh, their ego gets a hold of them too much, you know, and, and it's I got to have the biggest and baddest bike there is. And um, <clears throat> I'm a firm believer in you should start small bikes and learn the proper techniques of actually how to handle a bike and the, ride a bike. Right. And then step sure. up. Um, but, you know, then again, you don't want to show up at a bike meet on a 250 or 400 and everybody else is on a. You know, I live, I live that, yeah. I, <laughs> you I, know, know. I know that feeling for sure. But back at man, back when I was coming up, you know, shoot, 95, I got my first street bike, 96. I can't remember when I was 16. I uh, mean, there were so many people that rode, and it really didn't matter what you rode then, right? You could show up on a EX250 or a DRZ, right? It, it didn't matter. It was all the love for two wheels is, is the only thing that mattered, right? Of course, when we went, uh, ape ship crazy up in the mountains right if the, all the other guys got left but but we all uh kept up with one another sort of speak right we'd let you know whoever want to go go whatever just make sure everybody's safe and sound at the end of the journey really right. is, is all that matters and and it was more of the commodity too right nowadays i find when i do go out and ride i don't like to ride with people i don't know for one right. um and i don't like to be in a big group you know, nah, I'd rather just be nah, me. Bad news. Yeah, like two or three people, uh, uh, my sure. good friends. And yeah, I mean, if you want to go ahead and do whatever you got to do, by so means, boo boo, you do you, yeah. right? Yeah, the big um, groups are just the unknown. You never know. You know, you're going to have someone in there is going to do something that you wish they hadn't. And you might be right behind them or in front of them. So yeah, I prefer the smaller groups. I think it's safer for everybody. Unless it's like a charity ride and you're all kind of cruising together at a decided slow speed. But but yeah. racing through the hills, yeah, you want your your close buddies, people you can trust. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh it's always a good time and a fun time, especially when you ride with a, a group of close friends, you know, because you're all like minded, right? And you know, you've been riding together for so long you pretty much know where everybody's levels at anyway you know who's faster who's slower but at the end of the day again that's not what it's about you know it's about enjoying the journey to get to the destination you know sure. eat a good lunch talk some shit on the way back and yeah that's it yeah park at the top of the mountain and just feel like king for a minute that's it get out yeah yeah absolutely man so you you went you rode on the street how many years did you end up riding on the street and do you still I, I get think out I picked up the bike me and my buddy kind of go back and forth. I thought it was 2010, 11, but he says his his 09 
R6 was brand new. So I guess maybe 09 is when I started doing street. And then it was, I think, 15 or 16. Yeah, it was 15. It was the end of 15 when I first started going to the track. Nice. And what bike did you have at the at that time you, you did you first got on the track? Yeah, that was the 300, the Ninja 300, which is what I still have now. And a, we're building a 400. So Kawasaki, obviously, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I got a love for all the manufacturers. I started out with Kawasaki and I think you just kind of grow to love what you know. And I've never had any complaints out of Kawasaki, but I love the Yamaha um, TTR125 I've got. And the R6 is, of course, just a classic bike. Uh, I always enjoyed that. So. I got no particular favorite per se, but we go Kawasaki because it's been good to me. I've won races on it and the bike has never done anything completely unexpected or left me stranded. So, yeah, no, I, I, you're right. It, Kawasaki was my first bike. So I've always got a soft spot, right? Like, right. dude, I would love to own, uh, a 1996 uh, ZX7 double R, right? Not the R, but the double R, you know, with the flat slide carburetors and blah, blah. Better yet, a Muzzy Raptor, right? The 850. Uh, man, that I would just, uh, yeah. 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 It yeah would if, be, I had, if I had been rich, admittedly, I probably would have had a Ducati yeah, for my bike, but that's, it's just the look of a Ducati is it's just kind of hard to match that Ferrari red. I mean, it's li listen that the, the Ducati to me, everybody already. I mean, I got a tattoo of Ducati, so that just pretty much sums it up right there. <laughs> uh, it's it's a bike that I saw, like I said, growing up at a young age, and I was just like, What is and then when I heard it, I was like, That was it right. for me, right? And that that's that's my love of twins that that you know started for me. Uh, and then yeah, there, there's something special about owning a Ducati and riding it. It's, it's not that, oh, I'm better than you or money or anything like that. Cause shit, you can pick up a secondhand Ducati pretty cheap. Let's just be honest. Um, it's just something about the, the heritage is what it is. Sa same thing with the RC 51. I just got right. It's not about speed. It's heavy. It's slow. New 600 would absolutely smoke it, but that's not what it's about. Right. It's about the heritage. And when you ride it, man, it just gives you this, your fora that, me jumping on an R6 is not going to give me, or an SR1000 RR is not going to give me. You, 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 know, you know what I'm saying. Sure, um, sure. But, yeah, Kawasaki is uh, Team Green for sure, right? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, team, team Green. Team Green, baby. Sure. Yes, let's go. So my, my buddy Andrew Davis, what is up? I just had him on the podcast. He races a ZX9R98. Uh, yeah. He says, what's up, guys? And he says, Team Green on top. Yeah, absolutely, right? They, man, I miss I miss Kawasaki being in, you know, uh, MotoGP. Heartbreaking, heartbreaking. Yeah, uh, Moto America. It's, yeah. Yeah, not a strong showing for the Cowies out there outside yeah. of the, the club racing, so. But you guys are killing it at club racing level with the bike. I mean, it's an absolute yeah. weapon, you know. And I think they did a, a such a good job, Paul, making it uh, affordable to most people, right? Because you can buy a brand new six three six for what less than eleven thousand dollars. Right. I mean, right. that's you know when the R six was out, it was what fourteen, I think, something like that. At least, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's make imagine that Paul, right? When I bought my first ZX six R it was like sixty two hundred bucks out the door, right? Yeah. Now yeah, yeah. An R six is yeah, fourteen grand, a new CBR one thousand R R whatever is thirty thousand dollars. It's yeah. I always thought for something that could instantly be destroyed, it was a tough call to make to to like finance something. So I would yeah. always try to pick up something that somebody had dropped in the driveway and you know they were ready to give up riding so they would sell it for a reasonable price and be able to pay cash because yeah. one mistake and you're then you're making payments on something that you're not riding and I, I remember the horror stories of guys who were like upside down in a payment and just didn't have the bike couldn't get out of the payment and they're just watching their credit just plummet into the abyss as they yeah. are not even riding so We've went the cash route thus far. It's been good. And I say I've stayed kind of small. I've I've been on the small bikes, which are much more affordable. The 500 was, I say, a pickup from, uh, at that time, it would have been a pretty old bike. So it was it was affordable. So thus far, no no huge investment that if things went horribly wrong, wouldn't be able to get back to where I was at 
without you know selling a long or something oh <laughs> dude yeah listen I, I i get it i had so i had a man one of my favorite bikes i owned was a i had a 2008 1098s oh my god i think it was mm -hmm. uh, Dude, I'm telling you, it was so beautiful, man. It was like I didn't, but, I didn't want to. Yeah, I just, I was so scared of crashing it because it was so freaking expensive, right? And I paid it was twenty eight thousand dollars because we got, I bought that. It was like twenty one, twenty two because it was the S model. And then of course I was like, I got to get the seventy millimeter, Terramogany full titanium carbon fiber. That was six grand. I mean, you know, the racing ECU. And I remember I went out. uh for a ride with my buddies and i didn't know the road and i don't like to push myself on roads i don't know because that's the most stupid thing you can do really right so but but they kept telling me like look man you're gonna come up on this one corner it's a sharp right hand corner and it's gonna catch you off guard and it catches me and i've been on this road a hundred times right and if you do you don't want to run off because you're going to go over the side of a mountain. I was like, no problem. I got this. Right. And so here I am come up to it. You know, I see them break, I break and yeah, they wouldn't bullshit. And I was not prepared. Thank God a car wasn't coming over the other side. I just stayed leaning into it, looking through the corner. Right. And it was just like, Oh shit. Oh shit. I got this. I got this. I got this, you know, and just couldn't imagine that uh, if it went down, I'd yeah, absolute cry like a little girl, you know, cause <laughs> then I would be stuck. Right. Cause I didn't right. have full coverage cause it was paid for. And it was just like, sure man uh yeah yeah for sure yeah that's what caused my buddy to hang it up same thing that mountain road you hit that curve that you just kind of run out of time and he grazed the guardrail and that was his farewell song for that he he was lucky and fortunate so that was kind of right before i had made the decision to get off the road because you know once you get to a certain speed there's not really much out there for you except for danger you know especially if you're trying to do race speeds on the mountain you're you're one bad driver away from not coming home so yeah i mean that's yeah and plus you don't know if there's gravel out there you know it rained right. a couple of days ago. i mean you just right. yeah the gravel is is bad on those roads yeah sure. and it's such an unknown element too because you just you're going in everything blind you might know the road right. but the conditions constantly change and it's just yeah i was fortunate to get off the mountain alive for sure at any yeah. any driveway mishap along the way if it, it just one person pulling out and it would have been bad so i'm yeah. i'm blessed that i did that period and made it through yeah me, me too it's uh but you know you go out there and you tell yourself yeah i'm not gonna push it and then of course you always find yourself at least doing it once right and let's just be honest it's sure. it's hard not to do it you know but i still try i still ride on the street you know um i don't ride as much as I, i'd really like to but you know full-time job and wife and the kids so it's uh but when i do i do find myself i at least got a second third gear gotta hit the interstate whatever i'll, I'll take a ticket or maybe <laughs> run not right no, back then i would right but now no, no, never, not. Never. um yeah so dude i get it man i get it uh so listen okay so you went from the street right started doing track days mm -hmm. and then you started advancing in track days and you was like you know what i can do this like i can actually race and, and win right so what was your transition like going from just a track day rider to entering your first proper race Okay, so I've, I was going, doing track days periodically, and I don't remember what turned me on to the weir scene, but I made it down to a race at Tally, and it was just a very inviting place. I had a really good experience meeting people and watching kind of how everything operated, because uh, I felt I was moving towards that direction, and so I wanted to check it out. And to my surprise, the atmosphere there was similar to what I call the campground mentality, where it just everybody is pitching in, in a good mood. Um, I saw families, you know, all from the ages of racers who were in their 70s, pulling trailers by themselves to full families in motorhomes hanging out. And it just felt good. Uh, and in that same moment, um, that was when I lost my father. And that was the transition for me was the energy that was in me at that moment was too much for the road. And I could sense that. And I knew there was something building that needed a place to disperse and energy, whether it be a hobby, the gym, something. And 
racing came at that perfect time. Um, so at that point, I knew it was probably time to do it. And now I had a burning motivation in me to do it. So I decided to use that energy, dedicate what I did to my father, try to repay people through the process who had helped in my time of need um, through racing and started, I think it was 2017 was the first time, first season. So February of 2017, I think was, so about a year and a half maybe of track riding probably 10 times on the track at Barber and Little Tally with sport bike track time. And then just went down and, you know, they have, at Weir, they'll have a racing school. So you're going to do classes and you're going to have mock races. So they, they ease you into the system. It's pretty well put together. So for me, it was just showing up, trying to get the bike ready, I think was the hardest process, learning the rules and regulations and everything has to be, you know, hardwired, tied off. You can't be having this piece or that piece that's illegal. So once the bike got set up, um, a guy named Chris Wyman, I'm sure some weird guys will remember him. He had one arm. He had lost his arm in a um, street accident, but he had fashioned his bike to where he could race with the one with the one side and just an incredible mechanic, owned his own shop, he kind of took me under his wing and he was running C super stock, I believe back, back in those days. And he took me under his wing, helped me build the bike, kind of showed me um, the stuff that you only get from a racer, you know, who's going to be able to have some of that inside information. So I was very fortunate in where he got the bike set up, made sure everything was good. Sport bike track time had set up at least my riding position. I wasn't too, um, nervous going on the track i felt comfortable on the track now it was just to get used to racing and spending time with chris and time around the racers at weir races made that feel like it wouldn't be too bad so it was it was pretty quick going from track days to racing and it all was perfectly placed the timing was all just as it should be and i'm certainly fortunate in many ways, but Chris being my mechanic right there when I needed him uh, was was helpful. So I, I haven't spoken to him in years, but if he's out there, anyone knows him. I, thanks to Chris Wyman, man, he's that's a good fellow. Absolutely. So sorry to hear about your pops, man. I uh, um, fortunately mine are still with me. My mom and dad, I'm a huge family man. I go eat with them. Matter of fact, I'm going there tomorrow to eat dinner with them and Sunday, right? Of course, because it's Easter, but uh, so my grandma passed away. Uh, real quick story. 2012 was the worst and the best year for me, Paul. It was uh, – I lost my first two dogs I've ever had, right? And then three days before my birthday, I lost my grandma, which I was closest to besides my mom, my dad, and my brother at the time, right? Of course, my, my, my fiancé, which is now my wife, didn't have Rossi. And then at the end of that year, uh, Rossi was born. So uh, I lost both my dogs. Then my wife told me she was pregnant and my grandma passed away. And then yeah, wow. here comes Rossi. Right. But I'll, I'll never forget when <clears throat> my grandma passed away, dude, it absolutely destroyed me. I was at work. My dad called me. And uh, the first thing I said, I said, I just need a ride. No, 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 don't blah, 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 blah. I'm like, listen, I'm not going to go fast. I know you guys think I ride fast because I do ride fast, but this ride, this is not what it's about. I needed to clear my head. For me, that was the best solution, right? And I, I jumped on. I borrowed my uh, cousin Paul had a Ducati Monster at the time, and uh, of course he was like, "Yeah, he can take it." And everybody's looking. I'm like, "Right." So, man, I hop on it and I just, dude, I drove for like four or five hours, just rode the bike, just speed limit, just crying my eyes out, just, just. Ah. Everybody deals with it in their, in their own way, right? But to me, that's what helped me deal with it. Um, was riding because it was the only thing that clears my head right um sure. so yeah and, and it nice a fire in you that uh you don't know you have right so yeah it's uh i think that's a lot of people at the track uh i'm sure there are racers who just found racing for some a hobby or through some dissentry or for some reason other than turmoil or disaster or loss but i think yeah. a big 
part of the family out there are people who are doing just that. They're looking for a release, a place to put their energy, their time, something to keep their mind occupied. I mean, you know how it is. Riding is a good medicine for that because especially racing, it's if you have if you don't keep your focus singular on racing, then you're in danger. So I think in that moment on the racetrack, there's you can't think about anything else. You just can't. So especially in a moment where you're suffering, when you're on the bike and you're riding fast, you can find that meditative release that is difficult to accomplish in a world where it's loud and noisy and busy and appointments. You put that helmet on and you're riding and as long as you can focus on what you're doing, then the outside world kind of disappears. Um, so I think there is a lot of stories that at the at any racetrack, uh, but especially the motorcycle paddock seems to have people who have a compassion born out of suffering and loss and they coalesce at the track. And I think it's a respect of fellow racer, fellow commitment, investment. And we all kind of know on the inside that most of us have a story as well. And the brotherhood that is born out of that is very special. hundred percent. Couldn't have said it better myself. It's uh, yeah. Even to, to this day, you know, I got bad ADHD and, and of course my thoughts are everywhere and I don't take medicine. I don't do Adderall. I don't do any of that. Right. So it's, it's, um, even if I don't get to ride the RC 51, I'll jump on my little CRF 100. And just, even if I do a couple laps around the neighborhood, I mean, that's enough to clear my mind and be at ease with myself, right? Whatever stresses I handle throughout the day. It's also my stress relief, right? It just feels so good to put the helmet on and throw your leg over the bike and just twist the throttle. I don't care if it's got five horsepower or a hundred horsepower. It's, it's still the same feeling, right? At least it should be. Mm -hmm. Um, which is absolutely amazing. But listen, so we got we got Paul Pendergrass. What is going on, Paul? He says, what's up, Paul? In the grass, Pendergrass, man. I love Paul. He's he's one of the people that you that go fit right into the uh very right at Tally against me, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Paul's always beaten me. I don't I think at Tally, the last race, the first time I've ever placed in front of him. So good good ride, Paul. Once I got you once. So <laughs> That's but, awesome. Uh, he's he's that he sums up. He's the quintessential person you meet at the track who knows what they're talking about. Will do anything for you. Super friendly. I, I'm sure if you needed his shirt, there'd be no problem. But if there's something that happens, he's and I, I heard I knew that about Paul before I ever met him. I'd heard him being around the paddock, just kind of being someone who could help you out. And then we met. So he's he's um, the archetype of what we're discussing, the good person at the track. Don't let it go to, to your head, Pendergrass. <laughs> Nothing but love for you, Paul. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. He's an awesome dude, man. Awesome dude. And I'll, I'm sure he'll be he'll be on me next race. <laughs> yeah, that, that's so – do you guys live close to each other? or? Uh, I, I don't know where Paul's out of, actually. I just see him at the track, so I'm unfamiliar where – where are you from? Where are you from, Pendergrass? Yeah, where are you from, man? Tell us in the comments, man. Yeah. So, dude, that's awesome. So, you got into road racing, you started racing, and then, yeah, since then you've won some championships. A couple, yeah. We got fortunate. <laughs> yeah, I got fortunate. Um, the very first year, we came home with a championship. Uh, and then I went into what I thought was retirement. Um, took... I think four years off and then came back last year. It was my first year back and got uh, a second championship. So that's two national championships. But then we were able to pick up five regional championships, points championships last Bro. year. So. Bro, dude. It was, it was awesome. Dude, what's in your cereal, Paul? What's the secret? <laughs> what's the secret sauce in the cereal? Um, it's If I gave away the secret, Pendergrass would be – all over me <laughs> right right he says he... I, I, yeah i'm not gonna claim to be faster than anybody down there i just had a really fortunate year i didn't crash any and then come championship time it was just the day it was on that day um but there was no domination throughout the season i'll tell you that it was always a struggle for everything there's tight race and especially you know in the smaller classes as as you know with moto three and um the moto america series the junior cup there's some really 
tight racing in the smaller bikes and that transitions to the club too it's it's good it's good tight racing so absolutely it is dude congratulations paul you just so last year south carolina south carolina so last year uh you just you did an amazing proper mega job, man. I mean, how does it feel to wrap up, step away? First of all, win a couple championships and step away and then come back and just redo it again, right? It's like it Mike Hellwood when he stepped away from the TT and come back a couple years later and won the TT. Yeah. You know, it's it's yeah, crazy. Dude. It's unheard of, man. It's, it was awesome, man. It was awesome. Love my, right? Yeah. Uh that's to be to have his name mentioned anywhere around me for any reason is ridiculous but but cool um it's awesome i mean there's no other way to put it it was just a perfect year it was just perfect it was yeah. blessing on top of blessing on top of blessing so uh i hope somewhere in the universe that there's a way i can repay everyone for all that happened but it was just perfect i'm so all i can say is thanks to everyone who was a part of it who helped me out um just like i said before with chris um i've got a mechanic now uh, matthew satterfield he's a master technician he used to work um as a racer mechanic uh, back in the day and we don't know how we met uh it's a strange we can't figure it out but he same with Chris has been an incredible guide and help with building the new bike and with the 300. So without people like him and people who help with Pitten, then none of it would be attainable. And if it was, it would be infinitely more um, difficult, if not impossible. So without, without those people, um, it just wouldn't have happened. So Blessing on blessing with good people on top of good people, just doing good things. So I, I could be more pleased. And if I pass tomorrow, then I would be very proud and thankful for what already happened. Absolutely. A absolutely, man. Um, <clears throat> That's dude. That's, that's, Proper mega, man. I can't. Yeah, dude, that's awesome. You, you, dude, you're a champ, bro. Absolute legend. I said it from the beginning, Paul. Come on, man. Absolute legend, bro. But so <clears throat> for those that are listening, and me too, I'm curious, like, who's on your team? Who's your tire guy? Who's like, is it just you, you and him? It's just me. I'll have, I have different friends who will come out and help me from race to race. But usually I'm rolling solo with one helper. Matt will set up the bike and get everything ready. And then he'll just, I'll just check in with him and let him know uh, how I did. He's got a lot of busy um, things going on in his life. He's, um, he builds um, bikes all the time. Like he's always making people's bikes better, saving bikes that are almost dead and making great motorcycles better. Uh, so he usually sets me up. Um, I'll get everything to him prior to the race a week or two prior. We'll make every, make sure everything's ready to go and then we'll hook up the trailer and head out. And typically I'll be pitted between a Pendergrass or somebody else just like him. And anytime something's needed where I usually can count on someone to be there if necessary, but yeah. typically I'll have a helper, at least one helper sometimes too. Yeah, that's a, it, it, it makes it easier than doing it all by yourself. Right? You can't, <laughs> it's it's hard to come in on your bike. Yeah, and then putting the rear stand up with one hand and grabbing it. You got to pull it right next to it. And it's you'd be, you'd be surprised how much just some rear stand help is uh, <clears throat> beneficial right. during a race, especially like in July, yeah. like when you're burning up just to come off and have someone to do just that. Just putting your bike up on the stands where you can just hop off and start cooling off, especially if you've got another race coming up. Uh, it's invaluable it's hard to replace something like that and then like say in july when you're trying to catch wind and get some drink without that help before you know it you're 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 just trying to catch your breath and you hear your, your you know that your second race is coming up and you're like oh no so <laughs> it's it's time to go yeah. yeah anyone who has a helper knows you don't have to tell them they know how how beneficial that is it's not yeah. just to your well-being but to your actual race like the way you're going to be able to perform going to have a lot to do with how much energy you expend setting up when you get to the track and then in between races all that is burning energy oh but 100 percent, man so typically 
tell everybody like at a club level racer uh, and the champion you are when you show up what is your typical setup like you, you got an easy up tent a cooler yeah. a generator tire warmers extension cords let mm-hmm. everybody know what you need in case they're curious and yeah that's you're definitely if you can go to the track day without your track list then you are a better man or woman than i because i always check my my list it's a it's a page and there's just do, 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 do bullet points but the big ones are going to be your gear uh you're going to have i got two easy ups i'll have two fold out tables i'll have a high powered fan um, enough batteries to run all your um, lights, fans. Uh, I'll have a generator and that'll run tire warmers and anything, you know, if you have to charge some stuff like that. But for the most part, yeah, if you got your easy ups, your tables, your generator, your cooler, your fans, water, Gatorade, uh, your and your bike set up, then you can you can pull that off if you don't forget your gear. Uh, that's the main stuff. You need to be able to stay cool. Um, so the easy up is pretty much a must unless you're just he man and can just take the, the boiling heat. Right. So that'll get you, that'll get you out of the sun and then have your tables for convenience and coolers to keep your water and food, make sure you're eating and drinking. Um, obviously hydration is, is going to be your main factor come summer. And if you're not doing that right, then you can Jake Gagne is Gagne, uh, Gagne is going down. If he starts passing out, like yeah. if you don't drink enough water, it's bad news. Yeah, You're going to start cramping up bad. Yeah. And then it's not going to be fun. It's not, it's not going to be fun with people around you. Then it's dangerous. Right. I mean, right. Right. Yeah, that's, that's true. You're looking out for yourself and others when you take yeah. care of your health. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's a big part of it. You know, I, I remember it, it, I drink a lot of water anyway, um, especially when I'm working out or I'm going out there doing something physical, like, even a track day, right? Because track day is super physical. It's not as physical as a race weekend, but it's it's still mentally physical, right? And 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 physical. So yeah, I, I find myself. I did it one time. I didn't drink enough water, and exactly what you said. I cramped up so bad. I just pulled in. I was like, I just like my day was done pretty much after that. Yeah, um, it'll give you arm pump too. Oh, dude. With that. It doesn't and it was sense. hard to recover too. Because I was so dehydrated, but you don't realize it at the time. You know, you're like, oh, I drink a couple bottles of water. No, I drink a couple gallons. Yeah, um, in July, June, August, yeah, you're you're gonna you need to start drinking the night before. So what I'm trying to do is go ahead and be intaken the night yeah, before. Absolutely. So how do you prepare yourself for a race, Paul? Do you have any like certain rituals you do, like right boot on before your left boot or <laughs> uh no, nothing traditional like that except for I mean, I want to be relaxed. So for me, I just want to sit back in my chair and just kind of think uh, for a couple of reasons. One, to kind of calm myself. Two, to kind of think of a game plan for what I'm going to do. And three, just to kind of reflect on just life for a minute. Like no one wants to think about what could happen, but we all know what could happen. So for me, that's my tradition is relax, settle plan and then just kind of meditate on life itself just kind of go look at this like this is incredible it's a million miracles stacked on top of each other to lead to this moment and i just want to be thankful i want my last thoughts to be thankfulness if if they so be like if that happens then i want to be able to to know that in that moment i was grateful um and then i'll usually get a prayer in with mark a miracle. Um, yep. So he's usually, he's not at all the races, but typically if Moto America is not on, he'll be there. Um, he will usually find me pre-race or if not, I'll catch him near the grid and stop and pause and he'll throw me a quick prayer, but kind of hard to, to match the, the peace that comes with having, you know, a good man of God like that to sit there and have a conversation you him and god for a minute before you go out there so that would be the one tradition that i would absolutely have to keep no matter how hectic pre-race was i would make sure whether it was with mark or just with myself before they drop the green to have a a moment with god yeah and be thankful yeah, yeah big shout out to mark man he's awesome i've met him several times and uh yeah he's he can't be mark mark and his wife they do the the national anthem 
yeah. every time. It's, yeah. it's good stuff. And he'll do, you know, he'll have a service typically um, on Sunday. He'll have a service pre-race. Pendergrass will usually be in there. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and he, he does Facebook uh, ones too as well. He does, I see yeah. Him. Yeah, he'll do that. Sure, yeah. if you're not there, you can tune in and he'll usually stream it live. Or yeah. if you just want to stay at your pits, you know, some people – the pit will be real spread out, so sometimes I think people watch it at their pits. I think it's a wonderful thing. It's good. It's good stuff, man. Yeah, he's a, he's a real good he's a real good man. If he's out oh, there, I love him, Mark. Good, good dude. So I mean, obviously, I'd say rate your season last year, but it'd be a ten out of a ten because you come home with some champions. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean. I will say 9.9 because the, you know, God can always squeeze something else in there. Just <laughs> man, come on, man. It's a pit. Dude, it's 11 out of 10. Are you kidding me right now? How many championships did you win? Say it again, Paul. Uh, five regional, one national. Bro, uh, one more time. Just so everybody hears that clearly. Five regional, one national. Dude. 15 out of 10. Absolutely. There you go. Mega 15, job, 29 out of 10. Man. Yeah, there you go. The race number, 29 out of 10. Andrea Iannone, right? Number 29. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's like being a, it's kind of been mine for a little bit. You know, there's no really, body really out there big throwing it. And then he come back now. So just so y'all know, I had it in the, in the, in the gap. All right. Man. <laughs> he came when back. he was banned, I got it. Yeah. yeah. He came back after me. Yeah. Yeah. He called me up and I said, it was cool. I said, you go right ahead, man. So I can't help but pull for him. It's like, I'm drawn to that number. And I kind of like, you know, and he, you know, he's, yeah, what did he get kicked out for? I can't recall what he get banned. Uh, supposedly he, he ate some bad steak that had some, um, illegal, whatever motor GP test for some type of enhancing drugs is what it is. Right. And he said mm-hmm. it was a piece of meat that he ate at a restaurant in Indonesia. I think it was. Um, sure. And yeah, they, so what they did is they put a two year ban. Originally it was only to be a two year ban. So he fought it in court and it ended up since he fought it and went against them, they gave him a four year ban. Oh, yeah, dude, no bullshit. Right. So, yeah, then he finally come back and he won. Ouch. It was yeah, it was uh, absolutely well. He didn't win, but it was a podium. But it was still absolutely magical, okay. right? It's good okay. stuff. Okay. Man. Well, that's not too bad. I, I I had either forgotten or never heard the story, so I'm glad it's not yeah. something abominable. I'm glad it, that sounds yeah. pretty reasonable. Yeah. And I don't know what drug enhancing thing you could take that could do too much. I mean, we're not lifting right? weights. Okay. I mean, I guess if it's a stamina type deal, like a Lance Armstrong type situation, then that makes sense. But other than that, I mean, it's uh, that's good to hear. That's good yeah. to hear. I like. Steak. Yeah, I was me too. I like steak, dude. I just made a, a, a awesome flank steak last night for dinner. It was really that's good. Right. That's right. Yeah, yeah I absolutely. had blackened um, steak from Chef Eats last night. So. Shout out to sir. Big shout out to Jeff Servant and Chef Eats, man. Best meals you can get out there. And I tell everybody, man, you don't have to be a legend like Paul to get Chef Eats, right? You could be just like me and everybody else. We could order it, deliver it to your door. You could take it for, you could eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's healthy. He caters all types of meals for you. So it's not just, right. if you want just a high protein, you can do a high protein. You want something, yeah. a lot of meals with no salt at all, he can make it happen. And they're absolutely amazing meals. Um, I've been right. blessed where he sent me six free meals and I murdered every single one of them. <laughs> I mean, they were so good. Yeah. I need yeah, to reorder was, some more. Yeah. It feels good. Cause Jeff's a good guy and he's helping out a lot of racers. So I remember um, we had spoken prior to me having anything, you know, um, having any of the meals and then he sent out some stuff and I ordered some stuff myself on top. Um, and I was, I was really, I'm like, you know, here we go. Like I, I want this to be good. And I have not had one thing. I probably had 30 of the meals and I have not had one thing that I didn't really enjoy. And it's, I'm kind of a food snob. I'm, I'm allowed, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to do that at this point in my life. Um, and it's good quality. I didn't think you could get quality like that out of something you would heat up like that. You could ship, but it is. And I, I'm really thankful to him for, for helping me out this season. And if anyone's interested, then I would, I would recommend it. If you're into, if you're looking for like the, the, the meals to order, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, find something that quality that you can do that quick. It's, it's been good. So shout out to Jeff and Chef Eats. 
Yeah, dude, listen, 100% agree. And and I was telling my buddy, and he's like, dude, well, it, I mean, is it really expensive? You know, because I did, listen, I did, um, what's the other one? Uh, Fresh, I didn't do Fresh and Lean. Hello Fresh. I did Hello Fresh, right? Right. Listen, it was decent. I'm not going to lie. Some of the Hello Fresh meals were pretty decent, right? But it's it's all portion control, which is fine with me. A lot of people don't like the portion control, right? They, they, right? they feel like it's not enough. And I'm like, oh, it's absolutely enough. It really is. <laughs> but anyway, right. that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just, you know, I've tried it and same thing. You know, uh, the first time I had Chef Eats was in Jersey last year when I went to the last uh, Moto America round. And big shout out to Isaac Wilworth and his dad, Curtis. Um I was over there and I guess he's seen that I was starving and I'm not, I'm humble. I'm not going to ask anybody like I'll go and I don't like barbecue. And that's basically what they had was like barbecue. And I was like, man, I'm going to have to eat some barbecue. So I found the mission chips. Crook. I was like, man, let me get a couple bags of those mission chips to hold me over until I leave the track. Right. So anyway, he's like, Hey man, I got some pork chops over there, man. Go ahead and grab you one and some roasted potatoes. And I was just like, dude, this is a, what is this? This is a microwavable. Are you kidding me right now? He's like, dude, this is chef eats. And that's the first time. I heard about Chef Eats, and uh, yeah, it's it's uh, dude. Listen, and so anyway, what I was getting at is my buddy's like, "Well, ain't it ain't it kind of expensive?" I was like, "Bro, no." So if you what whatever you're gonna spend at the grocery store, you're actually gonna spend less ordering from Chef Eats because you get the the meal and a side, right? So if you go out and you buy steak and baked potatoes and blah blah whatever asparagus because I love asparagus, man. I can't I love asparagus. So you know, by the time you buy all that, dude, you're gonna you could spend 40 or 50 bucks, right? You could get four or five meals from Chef Eat. I mean, and and it's just got everything you need and it's so good. Yeah, well, Breakfast. the most valuable asset is your time. And it's that's the problem Facts. with fast food is typically it gives you the one benefit is it saves you time, but you lose all the nutritional benefit and the taste. Oh, so Facts. I think Jeff has definitely reached a plateau that I haven't been able to find with fast food where you're able to eat it quickly, but it still retains the healthy nature and taste. Uh, and like I say, I'm, I would not, I wouldn't talk about it a lot if I didn't really think the taste was good, uh, at the price point for what you're getting, it would still be good. Even if the taste wasn't good, it would still be comparable to, like you said, the other to-go orders, which I've had a couple of the other, the larger name brands, and they just cannot match the quality of taste. Mm -hmm. It's not even close. They have no. that artificial kind of rubbery taste yeah. to it. And Jeff shifts his, ships the stuff out in the ice packs. So it's like, it tastes fresh. So for something to be quick and nutritional and taste good, it's your time is your most valuable asset. So if you can find some, you have to put that mathematics in there. Like you can't yeah. just go, well, it's more expensive. You go, well, okay. How much do you charge per hour for you, your individual for yourself? Like, so start the clock when you're going to the store and then when you're chopping up the vegetables and when you're grilling the food and then how much does your power cost to run like, and the dishes. Yeah, exactly. And that's time too. Anything you have to do is time. So you're quickly running up your clock. So if you think you're saving money, then well, it's how how valuable is your time? And for me, it it meets that standard of quality to where I'm saving time and I'm not giving up the quality that I could have if I went to the store and, and took the time to cook. Which of course, you know, I'm sure Jeff would recommend that people still cook often because it's just a good thing to do. It's like getting out on your bike or taking a walk. It's a meditative process that can bring people together. You know, you can have your friends over or gather with your family. And then of course, when you cook something yourself, it it's rewarding. And then if you can feed others, then the reward doubles. But um, for most of us in reality, we just can't do that every night or yeah. even every other night. So for me, it's a perfect when I come in tired and I'm beat or if I'm on the go and don't have time, I don't have to go uh, like, uh oh, I'm going to have to eat something that's not good just because of the situation. So he bailed me out of that where in a moment where I need something, not only am I getting something quick, I'm like actually eating restaurant quality food because it is from restaurants. He sources his things from his food from restaurants and they're, you know, they're prepared locally where he's at so 
I can trust that the ingredients are fresh and Jeff is a good dude. So all the all the things that line up for me to be able to support it are there. Uh, listen, a hundred percent. You know, it, it's just three minutes and thirty seconds in the microwave. That's it. Let it sit a minute and I boom. put it in the mini oven. I'll be honest. I just okay. I throw it in the oven because even that's only thirty minutes. Yeah. So you, I usually I'll come in, throw it in, and then I can do some stuff. And by the time you kind of get settled in, you hear the timer go off. Good to go. Yeah, dude. You're so absolutely. I agree, dude. You should still cook at home because I love I love to cook. I get it from my mom, right? So, like when I get done here, I'm going there and make a homemade marinara, which is simple to do, right? It's a couple ingredients, but you're right. It does save time by ordering the chef eats meal, and it's great, dude. You guys should go in there. He's got a weekend deal, just like Jason Doss just said, dude. This weekend special, dude, is ninety nine bucks. I mean, you cannot yeah. beat that. And go probably- grocery race and there's a racer you like that has a promo code i've got a promo code you could use but if there's someone you want to support uh jeff's i i don't know how long the list is but he's definitely got a good group of people so there's probably someone that you would want to support and i um you'll get a discount and he'll help support that race team or racer Yeah, it's, so it's if you just email Chef Eats, they'll probably tell you, you know, who the racers are, and if you want to pick someone to support. Yep, absolutely. It's uh, his program's absolutely amazing. It really is, and what he's yeah. doing is 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 good. And it's one of those things. Until you try it, you won't believe it. So people, yeah, I was skeptical. I was skeptical. Yeah. I mean, come on, let's just be honest. Everybody is. You see, nowadays you see it. They even got the shit for dogs now, right? I mean, it's like, <laughs> dude, they do. It's crazy. It's expensive too. I haven't seen it's, that one, but um, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm they, sure they do. They they got they got home delivery with home cooked meals for your dogs, prepackaged. <laughs> okay, vacuum okay. I was like, okay, well, that's yeah, a, that's a fancy dog. It's cool. Facts, right? Yeah, yeah. So you have dogs. I have dogs. I'm an animal lover. Do you actually take your dog to the track with you? Uh, no, he's a big German shepherd and I would love to, but I try to minimize my distractions and he would definitely take some of my attention. And funny enough, the last race we were there, anyone who was on my side of the pit, there was a person who had brought their German shepherd and it just, it barked, it was barking to everybody the whole time. And I thought, yeah, that, that would have been me. They would have been a chorus of German shepherds barking back and forth. So. I usually uh, leave him at home, but I do see dogs out there. I've considered it, but I say I try to try to minimize your distractions at the yeah. track personally. Yeah, I mean it's it's listen. There, there there's a lot that goes into uh, racing, and you want to be mentally is mentally and physically prepared, and the mental side of it's a huge part of it. You know, and the more mentally prepared, I feel like. It, Listen, this pertains to anything in life. I feel like the more mentally prepared you are to go in any situation you face, just even clocking into work, I mean, any of that stuff, right? It's the, the better your day is going to be. Um, so, yeah, it's it's in at the racetrack. There's too many things that go wrong. And that's why I think it's important for you to have somebody there with you, at least just one person. Um, Definitely. You know, somebody to talk to, somebody to whatever the case may be. It's uh you need somebody there in your corner at all times. So listen, dude, 2024 uh, race season's already started. It is. Yeah. We're one, we're one race in at this moment. There was a race in Roebling, I think last weekend that I didn't make it to, um, but we'll be back at it next, next month back at Talladega. Nice. Nice. So what are your expectations this season champ? We'll see. We'll see. We're in expert. Uh, I seen that so, smile when I said champ. Yeah, you try to hide it. Don't hide it, dude. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We got second place in our first weekend out. So we'll see. We're going for the championship, Chris. That's what that's what you want to hear. <laughs> Absolutely. We're gonna leave it all on the table, my brother. We're going for it. So, dude, that's awesome. We'll you see the four hundreds being built if that. If we can get that finished early in the season, then our chances will exponentially blossom. Um, until then, it will be an uphill battle. But I say at this point, again, I'm kind of – I'm living after. You know, it's Jordan after he retired. Like, I don't – the pressure isn't there to to have to win a championship. So, I'm really just enjoying going out there and racing. I mean, obviously, the mindset is to win the championship. 
So I think it's actually probably better for performance if you don't have that pressure. So for me, it's a lot, it's a lot easier um, not having to think about accomplishing that again. So it it takes the pressure off. Bro, but we're gonna yeah, we're I, gonna I, our best shot, man, for sure. Bro, uh, dude, you're gonna you're gonna kill it. I mean, what are you talking about? There you man? go. There you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, dude, it's, it, you're gonna absolutely, dude. Listen, it's it's what you've accomplished, man. I, you know, me being a a fan of the sport, I've raced some, but I've never even won a race. Best I did was seventh in a thirty minute endurance race out in Phoenix. It was like thirty something people. I can't remember. This was two thousand two, um, but I couldn't imagine the winning. Right. So, so tell me about your first race win, your very first race win, Paul. What went through your mind? You was like, yes, it fell on top of the world. It was incredible. I mean, I think any racer will attest to there's nothing quite like getting to be on top of the podium. So, and I did mine in the biggest um, event of the year. So it was, it was perfect. And it, so l- l- let me ask you this, the feeling of winning your very first race versus the feeling of winning your first championship. I think they're similar. I think they're similar because obviously the championship is a bigger task to accomplish, but the road to it was much shorter than the road to the first win. It's like my whole life and riding the bike was the lead up to the first win. So it came with that. It was like the first real validation of all the efforts to to be racing. So the championship was, I would say, similar because it has its own set of um, invaluable uh, feelings to it and emotions. But to say that it was greater than the first win, I I wouldn't characterize it that way. Uh, But both of them are something that, is worth the struggle for sure. Um, anyone who's looking to do it and wants to know kind of how that, when you're, when you make it, do you look back and say it was worth it? Then absolutely. Um, especially for me, uh, it came at a perfect time and I won't say saved me, but it saved me from another fate that could have been different. And, the options were not great. Say when you're in a moment of distress or loss, then there's a lot of ways that you can be pulled. And to turn your loss into something good is certainly possible, but all the world doesn't really help you with that. It's not something that's going to come to you. You're going to have to dig in and find a place where you can take that emotion and do something with it. So for me, it was a culmination of wanting to honor my father and honor myself by n- not losing my path or who I was through loss and turning it. Like I say, with every, with every good action you do now, if it's inspired from someone or something in the past, you rewrite history. You literally change the past. Any person who's done something before when I'm inspired by their actions and then I do something because of that, I, they have lived more. So my father was was here. He his his guidance when he was here was able to lead me to that and the motivation to honor his life was the energy and the strength I needed to to pull that off. So in doing so, I I changed not only my history but his too. He was part of a championship. And that's that's more than winning a race, more than winning a championship is just having a life and an existence that you can be happy with, be pleased with. <clears throat> it was just what 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 found me in in that time. No, you listen. You, your dad is absolutely proud of you. Absolutely proud of you. Uh, I'm proud of you. Everybody else is proud of you, and I know your dad is. And Thanks, what, what, what a feeling, right? Uh, of achievement and accomplishment, and just knowing that he's there with you, some way, some fashion, right? And uh, 
right that's on the front the, of the bike, man. Twenty nine, right, right on the front. That's it. That's it. It's uh. So that was your dad's race number. No, that was his birthday. His oh, birthday okay. was July 29th, so I used that. And I'll tell you this, when I came back, I, I didn't start the season last year because I didn't think I was going to race. And I went to a race, and it took me over. So I wanted to come back. So I quickly got everything put together, and I made it out for, I think, the third round of the year. But the, my first race back after four years out was on July 29th, and we won. So. Dude. It's perfect. Perfect. absolutely dude incredible is what it is it's uh bro i'm proud of you i'm, I'm not happy for you man you. what you've achieved and what you've done is absolutely amazing it's uh well yeah. i appreciate it and that whole paddock is full of people doing the same thing they, i know they were absolutely lots of them uh, they've taken pain and hurt and loss and just out there racing racing That's man cool. living it doing doing good with it and yeah. uh I would feel blessed to be around people like that all the time. Yeah, they carry yeah. themselves in a in a different way. The kids yeah. are mature and the parents are grateful. It's and the energy is different when, when you're around people like that. The energy is completely different. I'm a big energy guy, so when you walk in a room, I can I'm like, yeah, okay. You pretty much know how people are feeling anyway, for for the most part, right? Because of the, sure. the tension, let's just say. Um, but Paul Pendergrass says, "Wise words, Paul. Can't wait to see you soon." Yeah, yeah, great ride at Talladega against me, by the way. Yeah, it was good. That was a fun race. We had we had a good one. I say he usually he usually smokes me, so it it felt good. It felt good. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's awesome. That's good stuff, man. Dude, so yeah, so going in this season, the goal is the championship. I can't do so. Do, do you have like a club or do you do you sell merch, t shirts, or hats or anything? We're working on it. Um, I've got a sponsor called Truth Be Told Apparel. So the concepts are in the working. We just weren't able to kind of get everything put together before this, but they're supposed to have concepts back to me this weekend, and then we'll have some stuff going forward. So uh, probably just the typical, you know, some hats, some T-shirts. Um, I've got posters and stuff like that. So we'll put together a little package for people who want to support. I mean, this isn't MotoGP, so I don't expect people to give away their money just because I'm I'm something special. It's kind of like a way to support your racer. It's the way I look yeah. at it. It's a way to donate to a race program and get something for it. Yeah, You, know, you, you just get something for your donation or whatever, if you just want to. Throw money at it. We'll, we're gonna have some nice T-shirts and hats. So that's it. Yeah. Well, l l listen. I think a club's a great way to do it. That's all my European friends did it, and I got to thinking. I was like, man, that's something that my friends over here need to incorporate. It's not. It's not asking for a handout, but it makes uh, people get more involved in the sport and they actually feel like they're part of Paul McKee's race team, right? They're like, dude, that's my name on the back of his bike. Look at that, blah, blah, blah. I got my hat. I got my T-shirt. Let's go, Paul, right? But it also helps you buy your tires and your and, and all that stuff because it's absolutely – ridiculous expensive right and the gas to show up to the tracks and the body work and getting your suspension redone and yada 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 i mean the list goes on and on um and food and your water right all that's it's, it's a good way to earn extra income to help you pay for that stuff but also gain a fan base too as well right and right. i think it's a, a plus so yeah when you get those t-shirts in you already know this guy right here wants to buy one all right, and all right. So the podcast for sure. i know the fan the gas one's in in the mail headed my way right it's it's <laughs> listen i'm getting some more coming as soon as i get them coming you already know it's in the mail i got some stickers i can send you now so that's right yeah put them um, in with that shirt Adam, I will. Send on. <laughs> for sure i will yeah, we'll get you on the there. bike we'll get you on the bike for sure uh do, do, you, do you do you prefer a hat or a shirt because i think i'm gonna order some more hats too shirt all day love a good shirt i mean i love i'll buy like you like you i just like i like club level or the people who are not so known in Mer moto america i oh, like man. buying their shirts man yeah. uh, it just it feels good to be supporting a team and i like I like a good shirt, man. I got my wear shirt here. Know, so just a, a good t-shirt. You can't beat a good t-shirt. I like the color purple too. It's black. This color, It's man. black? Dude, it's purple on my screen, man. I know. I, everybody, I'm wearing black. This okay. is black as could be. 
Okay, okay. Well, no I like to the, anyway, to the so. purple lovers, but this one, this one's black. <laughs> uh, they probably have a purple wear shirt. This one's I'm black. Sure, yeah, dude. Actually, actually dude, uh, the next T-shirts, man, I got because I've I, I got blue. I had blue and black. I want to do. I kind of want to change it up. I'd like to get like a. Actually, to be honest, with you, I'd love to get. I love pink. So I'd love to get like a pink shirt, right, with the logo on it, or, or like a gray. Just just change it up. Even purple, man. I like I like all those uh, old school ninety colors, right? That's what we're missing in the yeah. market. Everything is so bland now, right? Like, on the bike and stuff. But for me personally, I, I'm like black, gray, gray, black, black, gray. So you're Johnny <laughs> Cash, right? <laughs> it it just suits me. Uh, it's nice. It's like uh, if you remember Ernest. Ernest P. Worrell, like yep. his closet would just be the same outfit just over and over and over again. That's pretty much me, just a row of black jeans and then black shirts. So, so You're like, this is my, my Monday through Friday outfit, and it's all the same color. You're like, cool. That's it. We're all just working to get in our robes and pajamas anyway and kick it. So, Dude, facts, right? I mean, come on, man. And, and listen, Paul Pendergrass, dude, such kind words. Uh, absolute honor, dude. It really is. He says, Chris Simcoe, thanks for bringing great guys on here. It's excellent to listen to what I'm turning wrenches like right now. Man, thank you, Paul. It it, it means uh, the world to me. It really does. And, again, I say this to everybody all the time. I say it on my Facebook and Pendergrass. Dude, it's absolute honor. And thank you guys so much for all your love and support. It, it's it's uh when I think about it, man, it's hard for me to to express it in words. That's why I say it's just proper Megan. It's absolute an honor because, uh, yeah, I, I just don't just thank you. It's absolute honor. I mean, I, it is. I, I Dude, I get choked up sometimes. I really do. And I'm a type of guy. I don't mind so my emotions. I'll cry in front of you. I'll do whatever, right? I think I think when people do that, you show like you're a real human. And, and it's, it's, it's actually real. It's not fake or made up or bragging or whatever the case may be right it's uh yeah it's it's an absolute honor man messages i get throughout the day just whatever it'll be it'll, you know listen it, it, I, i'm a positive guy and it's hard to stay positive 110 percent of the day i mean let's just be honest right you you agree with that paul everybody agrees with that um but it's like things happen when it's meant to happen. I'm a big guy. I believe that everything's meant to happen for a reason. If it's meant to be, it's going to be. You can't force it. You can't rush it. You can't cheat it, right? So it's if – and, yeah, I'll be down and I'll just get this random message. You know, like somebody over there and it will buy one of my T-shirts from the Clothing King and they'll send me a message. Hey, man, look what just got in the mail. And it just – it completely flips my day around and it just makes me realize how grateful I am. Um in the worst times that I'm going through at the time, if that makes sense. Right. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's, it's absolutely amazing. So you just never know what's in the works, you know, you like don't. if you, without an, un, without the ability to, to know everything in the past and to be able to foresee everything in the future, then it's hard to make a determinative statement about any present action. Like anything that happens now how do you know if you don't know the future that it's not the spark or the nexus point of something incredible that's that's coming i'll i'll tell you a quick a quick story i love this one so i just <clears throat> it's going to be paraphrasing it's not going to be perfect but it's called the chinese farmer so there's a chinese farmer and he owned a horse prize winning horse so one day he hears some commotion outside and the horse has broken loose and the horse goes galloping off over the hills and the family gathers around and they say, Oh no, so sad. It's terrible. You've lost your horse. The prize on horse is so terrible. And he says, maybe. So the next day he he's out farming, trying to get things put back together. Here's a commotion over the hill. And here comes his prize winning horse, but behind him is five more horses. So everyone comes over and they go, wow, you're what incredible. Your horse came back. Now you have all these horses. You're a rich man. That's incredible. And he says, maybe. So the next day, his son goes out to break one of the, you know, start to break the horses because uh, they're wild. Hops up on one of them, starts to break the horse. He gets kicked off and breaks his leg. Everyone gathers around and says, oh, that's so terrible. Your son's broken his leg. And he says, maybe. 
So the next day, the army recruiters show up. There's a war, and they're coming to take him away, take his son. But his son's leg is broken, so they can't take him. So the message that I take from that is whether it be good or bad, you don't really know what it means totally because it could be good, it could be bad, maybe. But in a situation where you're going through something awful and it feels awful, maybe, maybe it's the beginning of something good. Maybe tomorrow your horses will return and they'll be better than, you know, more and more plentiful than ever. For me, in a moment of distress or a moment of great joy, I try to be level headed about it and go, maybe this is the greatest moment. Maybe this is the worst. But whatever happens tomorrow could change it. So at the highest times, be grateful. At the lowest times, be expectant of something good, because maybe your your time is tomorrow or soon to come. Dude, beautiful. Absolutely beautiful said. And where, where did you hear this from? Uh, I think it, I think it's an ancient tale. It's probably from a few, you know, I'm sure it's passed down through cultures. Alan Watts, uh, he was a philosopher, writer. Um, if anyone is into philosophy, then I would recommend Alan Watts. He's, um, you can YouTube his stuff. But uh, I, I came about in a library one time and found a book of his and started reading his books. But they've put all that on YouTube now. So if you want to do a quick listen, Alan Watts is just, to me, a great man of wisdom. He has. He started out as a pastor um, and then later kind of got away from that. Just a, a deep thinker, a philosopher. Um, but that's a story he picked up, you know, in one of his Far East travels. It's a wonderful story. Absolutely wonderful story. And Pendergrass says, heard that story from Paul at Chapel with Mark at Barber. Thought about it every day since. Oh, yeah, it really yeah. affect how That's you right. live if you think about it. Yeah, I mean, it's great. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's 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 what I love about people, man. I love people. Like I, my, my one of my favorite sayings is, "We're not strangers. We're friends that haven't met yet." Right. And to me, that's like deep, right? Because nobody's an enemy. We're all humans. We're all. I mean, we're we're here for the same reason, right? To to live and be happy and and prosper. I mean, that's what it is, right? Um, so yeah, it's, I I love to live by that motto too. Well, I think any typically someone who you don't get along with, or like you said, if if they're a stranger and it may seem standoffish, it's usually because you just haven't got to know each other. It's always just that boundary of time mm -hmm. spent. You know, if you were locked in a cell with a murderer, I'm still I'm assume at some point he would break down and be human. Um, I don't think everyone has definite good in him. I think life can take people and put them on a path where it's irreversible. But for the most part, yes, for most people, some time together just to understand each other, to, to have a conversation outside of reading the memes that describe your life. When you actually sit down in a room and talk to people. It's just like when I go out in downtown Birmingham, um, this closest city to I'm a suburb of Birmingham, you see everything on the news about how everything is so combative and people are at each other's throats. And you go downtown and there's every walk of life, no matter your belief, um, your your way of life, your origins, where you're from. For the most part, people get along incredibly well. It's when they are separated and are told things about the other. And don't have a chance to ask direct questions and go, was this, I know you feel that way. It sounds ridiculous or horrendous. Explain it to me. Like, tell me how you feel. And I don't think we get that conversation a lot. And if you don't, then it's hard to, like you say, it's hard to be a friend with someone until you have time together. Yeah. Easy to misconstrue their way of life or something they believe until you get to hear it from their own mind. The reason they believe that the reason they think that. No, it's absolutely so true. You know, it's like, uh, I always, uh, I love to talk to people. I love to meet people. Obviously you guys know I'm a talker, so I love to talk anyway, but, uh, it's, I love to meet new people. Right. And, and, uh, their vibes and get to know them as a person and get to know their stories and nine times out of ten it's like 
we end up most of the time liking the same food or or sort of the same food, right? Uh, just everything. We so you'll have more in common with people than, than you realize you have in common with people. Um, and and you know it's it's hard to sometimes break that barrier down, right? Because people put up that wall and that shield, and you know, but that can go that that's a whole another conversation. But yeah, in general, it's it's good to be a dude. I, that's what I tell my son, dude. Be good to everybody. Absolutely, be good to everybody. Help everybody out. If somebody's you know says something mean to you or bad to you, just smile, knock it off. Because in the end, it don't really affect you, right? Just just stay positive. It, so well, I think yeah. everyone knows in that moment when they've been going through something tough and you're just in that you feel during your you wake up and you just feel bad. You're out yeah. and you're just trying to get through the day. You know, you just you're suffering for this reason or that. And someone does one tiny gesture, just some stranger does something nice like that can be the thing that can be the point, the beginning of your turnaround. And I try to always think that is like in a group of 100 people, someone in there is on the verge of going the right or the wrong way. And if you are the last straw that does something unpleasant, it was just nothing to you. It's just a, a one off with this one person. But to them, that could have been it. That could have been the, la- the, the thing they go, that's it, man. That's it. You know, forget this. I'm not putting in the effort. It's not worth it. I wasn't. You could be that moment, but you could also be the other moment. You know, the yeah, per- you could be that one friendly thing you do to that stranger could have been the thing that makes them go, you know what? There, there is hope. Like there are people out there that care. And you, you know, you're passing those people every day, every day in the road. And then, you know, the people, in fact, I would say a lot of the people who are angry and acting out on the highway, they're suffering. They're just suffering, man. So I try to remember that when someone's aggressive or gives you the bird stuff like their punishment is their own life. They have to go home and feel bad. Like if, if being in traffic can break you and get you that upset, then life is going to be tough. So I don't have to return the bird. I don't have to give them, you know, the, the angry look because they're going home with the angry look in the mirror. They have to live in that state of being. And that's sad. It's unfortunate if you can be pulled out of your peace by everyday occurrences. So I yeah. in a way pity and try to have compassion for people in that situation because without the right moments in my life and blessings who knows i might have ended up in that same position where someone's looking at me in traffic and going what's what's wrong with him like what's up his tail so yeah. try to remember that most people are acting out of pain or fear no matter what they're doing if it's some action that's dishonorable or mean it's they're afraid of something that they haven't taken care of, accomplished, that's on the horizon, or they're in pain. They're suffering. Right. And they don't know how to cope. They don't know how to process. And they live day to day, putting a Band-Aid on it every day with little dopamine hits, uh, with social media and this and that, ways to get you through looking at the news. And if you never treat that symptom, it'll just eat you up and it'll come out in every aspect of life the littlest thing will set you off and, and take your peace. Like I say, you're only hurting, you're hurting yourself the most. You may offend and bother other people, but until you can get that peace, then you have to live with yourself every day, every minute. So you got, you got to get that part figured out. And then you feel more compassionate for other people. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. You know, one thing I do and, uh, I don't eat fast food, but of course my son, he's, you know, he likes his, uh, Chick-fil-A, you know, so in, in his, uh, KFC, I gave him KFC. I let him try KFC for the first time the other day. Right. Well, that probably sounds bad to people, but dude, I'm like a a health nut, man. Like I've turned into this health nut. So, but anyway, so my point is like, when I go through the drive through, I'll pay for somebody's meal behind me. Right. I don't do it all the time. Don't get me wrong. I'm not rich by any means at all. But yeah, there's days I'd be like, yeah, I want to pay for the guy's meal or the girl's meal behind me. Are you sure? Yeah. How much is it? You know, 30 bucks, whatever. I got it. 
put it, you know, I got, or same thing at the gas pump. I'll, 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 I'll pay for my gas. And then I go up to the window and be like, Hey, I want to prepay. There's a guy behind me, a girl behind me. I want to prepay, you know, 10 or $15 on it for them. So when they pull up they they have it. And they're just, you, you, I pulled off several times and I watched the reactions, especially at the gas pump. And they just, they look around because they, they want to say thank you. Right. And how happy they are just to receive that. Or, or maybe it changed their day because they're living check to check like most everybody does. And they got, you know, scrounging for pennies and they don't have a whole lot to, to get in their gas tank to help them out for, for the rest of the week. And I just gave them $15 worth or whatever. Right. To me, I get the satisfaction of doing that. Um, so yeah, I do that. I'm I'm, I'm guilty of doing that. So yeah, I, yeah I, I think it's good. I think if everybody would do that, it'd make the world a, a little bit better for sure. Yeah. What's well, a planted seed? I mean, I think every action people take comes from something occurring. So when that happens, when a random act of kindness falls upon you, I would think for most people, it would at least initiate that thought process in their head of thought, you know, and once you get that churning, they may scoff at it, never think of it again, but somebody won't somebody that will be the beginning of something, even if it's just them going home and treating their kids better, right. Or going home, stopping by and buying some flowers for their wife or whatever. Like you may have been the thing that got dinner brought home that night for the, for the kids because he was in a better mood or she, uh, was able to, like you said, afford something because, and, and you know how it is, especially if you're a, a person who has faith and you're believing in something like that. And then it happens to you, you know, you're faithful and you're praying, you're saying, Lord, I just need, I need a little help. And then someone drops some help on you. I mean, that can certainly change your outlook on life and possibly your, your future. Your whole existence. Yeah, you know, and talking about it, dude, I've had somebody pay for my meal once th through a drive through right? Like, this guy in front of you is paying, paying for it. And I was like, what? Really, dude? This is awesome. So, dude, I never forget. I pulled up to the light because I pulled out. Well, you know, fast food is fast. This was before I was a health nut. And I pull out, and the light was red. So I get out the car and I go knock on his window. I was like, bro, you didn't have to do that. But I just want to let you know I appreciate you. And I hope your day is just as mega as you are. Thank you so much. You know, and I jump back in my car and, and, and do it, you know, and that's what, that's what started it for me too. And I was like, dude, there I don't know this guy. He, he done paid for my meal. So I'm a, you know, like the movie pay it forward. And yeah, there's, there's times I'll go out there and just, even at Starbucks, you know, me and my wife will order a Java chip. That's my drink. I like the, I like, I like the, uh, the, the macchiato and I like the Java chip. Right. Um, and yeah, I'll be like, I'll pay for the people behind us or whatever. So yeah, it's it's, it's good well, stuff. See, it started you, so it was. It did. Strange. That's what I'm saying. Probably the same thing for that guy too, man. Same yep. thing. Somebody did it for him. So point good. proven. Yep. <laughs> good stuff, man. Good nice stuff. Work. Listen, Paul, dude, we're I'm coming up on an hour and a twenty in this, man. I want to. I want to listen. This has been an honor. It's been a lot of fun. We will do. You guys stay tuned because I'm gonna. Have, we're gonna have a part two. We're going to get Paul back on midseason, Paul back on at the end of the season so he can tell us how many more championships he won this year, um, which I can't no wait. Pressure. It's going to be no super pressure. excited. No, no pressure, pressure at all, right? None, none, none at all. Yeah. But uh, but before we end this, I want to get into my favorite part of the interview, away from racing, away from all that good stuff, right? So um, I want to know more about Paul as as Paul, right? So uh, I want to start it off as, as uh, what kind of music do you listen to, Paul? I'm like you. I'm going to go eclectic. I've got something for every mood. Um, I played in bands for a while and we were, I wouldn't say full blown metal, but that type of music. Um, so if I'm going to the gym or doing something physical, then I'm going to put on some, some era E R R A. They're local boys here from Birmingham. And if you're into that music, then trust me, go listen to, to era. You'll, you'll thank me later. You're welcome. Um, if I'm at the house, the most, mostly I'm going to have Bill Evans on, I'm going to have some, some piano, some light jazz, maybe some John Williams, you know, some classical, um, for the chill moments and then if i'm on the lake or hanging you know out with the boys then some skinner some zeppelin aerosmith uh allman brothers throw it back stevie ray vaughn yeah i love all that 
I, I every every person you named, I, I jam it all. Frank's not all of them. It's uh, right. Yeah. yeah, that's usually what's going to be at my house. You're going to hear some some ivories being tickled, something low, instrumental, just to relax. Yep. The Isley Brothers, yeah, dude, that's dude, that's yeah, absolutely. And when I'm in the mood, don't get me wrong. Hey, I like some gangster rap every once in a while. I'll throw in some Young Dolph for sure, right? Biggie Smalls. I mean, come on, man, yeah, for real. But most of the time, it's dude. I, my playlist is just ridiculous. I just hit people at work like, how can you listen to Frank Sinatra and then turn around and listen to Metallica? And I'm like, how can you not? Right? Like, right? Yeah, for most, it seems like can. a different mood. You. Seems like every person would have mood music, right? You don't, you can't play your favorite music all the time, right? No. Seems like seems like that wouldn't work. It wouldn't. You're you're right. Um. So, do do you have a favorite movie, Paul? Uh favorite movie. That's a good question. Um, probably not. Uh, there's so many classics. They hadn't made a good movie in a long time, in my opinion. So I'd have to go in the way back machine. Uh, if we're going pop movies, I'm an Indiana Jones type of guy. I just like that. I mean, we know that's not something deep. It's not going to move you or change your life, but I think he's a good role model for people to have that type of character. I can, I see myself in that. And I like that. I like adventure with some comedy in it. I think that's a good way to go. I don't usually do serious too much. Yeah. yeah. Nice, nice. So let me ask you this. Favorite comedian? Favorite comedian. Mine's George Carlin. Oh, you going in the way back machine too. Okay. Dude. If we're talking, yeah, Norm MacDonald. There's no question. Norm yeah. MacDonald by far the greatest comedian to ever live, in my opinion. And one of the best people, as far as I could tell, through just reading and learning about him. So there's no need to mention anybody else. Norm okay. McDonald, hero. Yeah. Yep. And, and God bless him. He passed away. Um, yep, from cancer. So yeah, and didn't tell cancer, didn't tell right? anyone about it too. Nope. Even his some of his friends didn't know about it. So mm -hmm. I, he did what I would expect it from him, like the most honorable, courageous thing you could do. He did so. Uh, Norm McDonald, man. Good. Absolutely. Good, good fella. Uh, yep. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. So, uh, books. Everybody knows I, I love audio books, right? I listen to a lot of audio books. What, what book do you, do you, are you an audio book listener? And if so, what are you listening to now or reading? Um, some, yeah, I was listening to, um, what's the, the Moto GP guy that you, John Hopkins uh, Leathered. Yeah. I was just listening to John Hopkins. So I'm a few chapters into that. Um, typically I'm reading philosophy or, or something like that. I've got, oh, we got the Bible, of course. Number one, um, yeah. this is a good one. Uh, river of darkness. It's kind of like, um, from the Columbus times, this is Pizarro, one of the Spanish explorers that came over to central and South America. And it kind of gives you uh, a really good description of what that would have been like to be one of those warriors that was coming to the new world. Like everyone knows the Columbus story and you get kind of the cliff notes in school, but to actually read the detailed description of a descent down the Amazon for men who had no clue what was around the corner and the whole trip they're being attacked just the whole way, every second they're being attacked by every single tribe they come into contact with. And they're having to fight, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, every corner. And they had no clue what was coming, right? They're just in the middle of the Amazon. And if you've done any kayaking on big rivers, then you understand what an undertaking that is anyway. But to do it into a world that you have just straight into the unknown, um, so that's that's kind of what I like, real stories of history and then let's say philosophy, things to get your to get your mind open up, you know, because once you once you learn how to learn and think, then you can do you can do anything. You know, that's that's the foundation for everything else. So I try to get history and philosophy in and then have my fun here and there. Yeah. John Hopkins is 
Interesting. Going going well. I, I like him, man. I like him. I, he was, and I never knew his story pre-hearing the um, first couple chapters were in, but yeah, it's, it's dude, he's, it's, he's hanging it out there for sure. Dude, I'm telling you, you just wait, it gets better. You it's it's intense. It's uh yeah, I think I'm like chapter three, so we hadn't gotten too far. No, no, you have you just barely scratched the surface. It's a great book though, it really is. Um yeah, and uh so you know, I ask this to everybody because I'm a big Star Wars fan. A lot of people don't watch, a lot of people do. Do do, do you prefer Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars, but but caveat, only the originals, only the OGs from the seventies. After that, I gotta I got part ways. I don't. I just ignore that those exist. But the first three, I mean, you could put that at the top of my movies too, because it's got John Williams does the music, just like Indiana Jones. I mean, you got George Lucas. Um, so as far as filmmaking goes, um, that's a that's a masterpiece. All three of the original films. Absolutely. <laughs> and so, my next question: What Star Wars character would Paul be? Han Solo, man, all day. Han. So, so look, my next question to follow up to that is, dude, did Han Solo shoot first in the cantina? Yes. I think so too. I, I do. Think he did. I, I think, think he did. Too. Under the table. Yeah. Yeah, you can't wait. Think. Look, look, if it's a fair fight, all right, then you wait. But if it's if it's a guy who's already out for you, you know, he's coming for your head, then yeah, you can't can't wait on that facts right 100%. I, think, I think han would have got him first because it because it's morally okay because of who the guy was right but <laughs> it'd have been a fair fight then he shot second uh, that's awesome dude i love it i love it and we touched based on this a little bit man food everybody knows i love to cook uh i mean i love all types of food greek indian thai food you name it i freaking love it i do not so this is something that I, i've never said a lot of people don't know about me man is i do not like barbecue i'm a i don't like a lot of pork i don't eat a lot of pork at all i mean even bacon yes it's good i just yeah i, I just don't eat a lot of pork right um and I, i'm funny when it comes to to certain foods i'm just and sauerkraut oh i dude absolutely not i'll nope I don't care how you cook it, how you, but whatever. I've tried it. Have it in lamb. No, I don't, dude. I, I'm funny when it comes to that, but pretty much anything else other than that, yeah, I'm, I'm good with. So, what's some of your favorite food, Paul? Uh, Cajun, Cajun seafood. That's going to be top always. Seafood, 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 and then more seafood. Uh, but a Cajun twist on seafood would be my ultimate for sure. Some crawfish. Uh, uh, on the top of pretty much any fish from the Gulf of Mexico. It'd yeah. be perfect. Um, my go-to here in town, there's a Greek restaurant here in town called Joe's, and I've developed a relationship with the owner, so it's it's like my little cheers in there. So I get to go in, and he makes uh, everything in-house, the dressing, all everything. So mm. for me, um, some seafood, and then Joe's here in town, and we call it a day. Colin and then I'll, you know, and then I'm gonna do steak and burgers and all that. Of course, and chicken on the grill anytime I I get a chance during the summer. Yep, and chef eats. Y'all don't forget, oh. chef eats too as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yep. Um, you won't regret that one. Yep, you can't forget <clears throat> chef eats. Uh, man, I do. Man, I love seafood too. Like me and my son, we tear that shit up. My wife, she's like, she'll just eat crab. That's it. She won't eat shrimp. She won't eat lobster. She won't eat anything. Oh, I'm like, I, I want it all. Bring it ocean. all to me. The whole ocean. Dude, my favorite fish is mahi mahi. Yeah, that's that's what, and mahi is what I just, it was two nights ago I had Chef Eats had mahi and it was mm. big old piece of fish too. Oh. It had like a, I think, um, pineapple on it maybe. It was, mm. it was dope. It was dope. Mm. Dude, have, have you ever grilled pineapple or watermelon or peaches? I haven't. I've had it grilled Bro. on dishes, but haven't Bro. done it myself. Bro, listen, next time you go to the grocery store, get you some peaches when they come in season. Um, and, dude, listen, pit it, cut it in half, take the pit out, slap that a little olive oil 
or avocado oil. Throw that bad boy on the grill for a minute where it gets a little warm. It's got that charred grill. Oh my God, dude. It's huh. so good. Eat it with like chicken with like watermelon and fresh mango cut up with watermelon and all that. Mix it up with like a salsa kind of. Oh my God, dude. Are you kidding me with some cilantro and lime? Bro, yes, I can cook. Let's get it on, hey, baby. Where's the grill at? I'm hungry. I'm hungry. <laughs> right? Dude. Yeah, 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 that sounds good. All right. Note to self check it is the weekend so yeah man the grilled peaches is absolutely amazing grilled watermelon the only thing with watermelon is of course it's super liquidy you literally throw it on there for like a couple seconds and flip it you just the idea is just to get the kind of little char marks right, right. but dude it's so good it's like yeah, i don't do watermelon because it's like just pure water to me it's strange it has like that <laughs> i call it just like a water flavor it just tastes like water to me i don't it's dislike nice. it but just not my jam now, nah, dude, listen, I feel you, bro. Absolutely, I do. It's uh, yeah, I do. So, um, celebrity crush, I ask everybody this question Do you have a celebrity crush, Paul? Nah, man, celebrities, no. nah, uh, not even growing up. Who's your celebrity crush growing up, man? Yeah, that's somebody, yeah. See, I, I'm running through the through the mind. I, nah, man, nope. Okay. Let me okay. uh I'm I'm gonna put it running in the background here. All right. We'll all see. Right, we'll see. Right. But no one jumps to mind. Uh usually uh someone local is gonna be a, a crush over someone famous. So I just was I don't remember ever having that that moment where it, I, I always was crushing on someone in school. I didn't have time for I think like Jennifer Love Hewitt, maybe. What's, okay. What was she? Yeah. That, that was back in the day. That was back in the day. Yeah, absolutely back in the day. Yeah, somebody, somebody like that. But For sure. But for sure. All right, so what advice would you give your younger self, Paul? Question everything. Be Facts. inquisitive. When you are told something, ask why. Ask how. Take the time to learn stuff, not just ingest it, but to actually download it. Um, and then make a plan. Make a plan. Like have a direction, even if it's not your end direction, be moving forward. I always say, you know, place is not what determines you. Trajectory is what determines like a good stock is one that steadily it goes up and down but it goes up mostly so make sure your trajectory is up when you're making more moves towards getting better than mistakes falling backwards so just question question everything yeah. look deeply into all the stuff that you thought was just a given I like get it. rid of I, the word fact and start taking everything as opinion. Uh, even if it's a well-based, learned opinion, look deeper yourself. Go find, go affirm that fact on your own. And in that process, even if you do affirm or reaffirm a fact that you believed in, in that process, you'll still be growing because you're questioning something that you believed, which is going to be the most difficult task. Everyone can question stuff they don't believe. It's taking the you that you think you are and dissecting that, looking at all the decisions that you make and your trajectory and who you surround yourself with and what you do and looking at that on a, on a, on a deeper basis and try to figure out what's best suited for you and get that plan going. Yeah. Always at least be moving towards your plan or your, or your goal. Do something as much as you can to be progressing. That's right. That's right. It's, it's like, uh, I try to, to learn to be, uh, living uncomfortable instead of being comfortable all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I mm -hmm. think it helps you grow as a person mm -hmm. instead of just, Coming home, doing doing the same things all the time. Do something you don't usually ever do. You're uncomfortable doing doing it. Whether whether it's skydiving, free base jumping, mountain climbing, whatever it is, right? Get out your comfort zone, and and you'll find that, uh, yeah, it'll absolutely help you. Um, 
Yeah, there was a philosopher. I don't know his name, but he would, that was part of his regular practice was he would go out and literally walk backwards and do, try to do things in a completely strange way just to try to break his mind of the monotony. So it was like a, a mental practice to do what what you're referring to is to just to try to get make sure you don't get in a malaise. Make sure you don't wake up one day and you're stuck in a routine that not only do you not love, but is not taking you where you want to go. Yep, that's right. A hundred percent, man. So are, are there any other sports that you're into besides two wheel racing? I grew up doing all the sports, you know, and. In suburbia, you play everything. So I played ten years of baseball, basketball, football. But uh, once you once you reach a certain age, if you're not from the land of giants, it becomes different. So racing is more suited for my stature. But I loved it. I mean, I made a lot of good friends back in the day. Uh, I had a good time. And if a basketball game breaks out, I'll I'll play. But for the most part, I haven't played sports like that in a while. I, I do kayaking and biking. You know, I've got my dirt bikes. I've got my mountain bike. So outdoor things such as that, mostly kayaking. I was on the water today, earlier this morning, went out and kayak for a few hours. So that anywhere I can be out in nature and be doing something considered um, athletic or a sport, I think that's where I feel most at home. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm me personally. I've always been drawn to water, whether I was a, a fish in my last life or w- whatever it is, man. I just find myself. I'm just, I'm so attracted to water. Like anytime around water, I'm like, I gotta go get in that water. Like, I don't know what it is. Right. So for me, kayaking, swimming, going to take a ice bath down here at the Creek. Yes. You can take an ice bath in the Creek cause the water's absolutely cold enough for sure. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I just love being in the water. It's something about, it's just something about it. It's uh, it's almost natural, if that makes sense, right? It's like uh, I kind of refer to putting my helmet on, getting ready to go out on a motorcycle. It's that same serenity you get, um, where your mind's just really clear, you know, because you're hearing the water. You close your eyes, you're hearing the water. You know, the waves are going a little bit, and you know, floating down the river or wherever. It's amazing it's an amazing feeling yeah. it really is being out yeah, there well, in nature. you're made of water you know and the earth Absolutely. is is mostly water so i i think you're certainly predispositioned in your nature to be drawn to water i mean for me it's everything it's where i want to be I, my my happy places if there's a river or a bay or an ocean somewhere nearby i mean even if you just have a piece of water out your window it can change your mood so yeah. i'm I think there's no two ways about it that we definitely have that ingrained in us. We are of water. We're made of water. So the, the instinct to feel at home when you're in, it seems natural. hundred percent buddy. A hundred percent. So let me ask you this. Are you a PlayStation or Xbox guy? Well, when playstations were that big and little gray things, uh, I was a PlayStation guy, but that was, <laughs> a long time ago so i haven't i've fallen off i haven't played in eons so but if i had to pick who who's it again playstation xbox yep, yeah PlayStation, let's go with playstation xbox. i think the xbox yeah. had some hideous controllers that were like <laughs> horrendous i never wanted to learn that thing yeah, so. uh, i love it so if i, I got to pick it. Let's go PlayStation. All right. I'm with it, man. I'm with it. Now, if you want to buy me like a new PlayStation and get me one of the MotoGP games, then I'll play. I'm in it. That looks pretty good, good. man. It's good. It's a lot of fun. But it's like, am I going to invest in that for like one game? Yeah. So, it looks fun, though. Hey, I'm I'm a I'm a nerd when it comes to PlayStation or Xbox. I, I like to play video games. Obviously, I wouldn't. Well, of course, when we was growing up, the Nintendo first come out, right? I remember me and my dad playing Super Mario Brothers and Top Gun on the Nintendo and Tecmo Bowl and all that double dribble and yeah, man, that's where my video game uh, passion come from for sure. So I still play. Obviously, uh, we have a PS4. Well, I had a PS4. I gave it to my son when I got my PS5, but he stays in my living room playing my PS5. So. Yeah, uh, put it this way: out of every week, I might play mine for an hour, maybe if I'm lucky. But I don't mind, you know. I I just enjoy sitting in there with him, 
watching him play. He's like, Daddy, check out this new skin I got with these V-Bucks or watch me play this battle. You know, to me, it's 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 my spending time sitting on the couch, yeah. cuddling with my boy, eating popcorn or whatever it is, watching him play his video games. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, – Yeah, I love yeah. when my dad would come in and, yeah, I would do the same thing. I'd be like, check this out. And he he didn't care, but he would he would watch, and then he played with me, and of course yeah. I'd destroy him. Absolutely, and he'd just be the sacrificial lamb, and he'd just be sitting there, just getting pounded. <laughs> and I'm just loving it. I'm like, play one more, one more game, and he would take a beating just just to be in there hanging out. So I yeah, can, I can see that. Yeah, man, it's my boy's my everything. I know everybody knows it. It's it's uh it's the main reason why I still you know that I do this podcast is one day because when I'm dead and gone, he he's always got YouTube and Spotify and all that stuff to to listen to my voice. You know, um, I wish my dad had done something like that for me. You know, yeah, um, but yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you this, Paul: your favorite racer back in the day and your favorite racer today. Shane, back in the day, motorcycle hero. Um, Casey Stoner, up there, of course. Uh, I love Rossi. Um, present day, I'm going. I don't have a particular. I don't have a favorite in MotoGP, Moto2, Moto3. Those are all just races that I enjoy watching. Um, Moto America, I'm pulling for people that I've. I'm pulling for everybody. But uh, I have a particular soft spot for people I've raced with. Blake Davis is someone I'm I'm rooting for big time. I, I've always known he was going to be something special. Uh, Kayla, you know, she raced Weira. There's a lot of people that are in Moto America that were came up through Weira. So if it's someone I've raced with or no, that's typically who I'm going to be pulling for. So uh, today we'll go we'll go with Blake Davis for today. He's my my favorite professional racer currently racing Nikki Hayden is king always my favorite of all time uh but for today yeah okay yeah well so I'm the same I well of course when Rossi was still racing he was my goat the the end all be all I don't care who else was racing whatever I'm like nope VR46 that's it end of story don't want to hear nothing else but I find myself that after he retired Man, I've been such a fan of the sport that I'm a fan. I, I, I like them all. I like everybody. But my favorite riders are my friends that race in Moto America and British Superbike, people that I actually know that I can cheer for and root for, right? So I'd rather donate to them, join their club, right, or buy a T-shirt or a hat from them and support them versus going out and buying another Valentino Rossi hat or a uh, – or you know who, whoever it is. Um, so yeah, those are my my favorite riders. But if I was gonna pick my favorite rider in MotoGP right now, um, man, God, it would be hard just to pick one because there's so many I like. But everybody knows I'm a huge fan of Baby Jeebus, Pedro Acosta. Um, but before he came, um, uh, dude, Brad Bender and Jack Miller. I love Brad Bender and Jack Miller, man. They're absolutely in Jorge Martin. And, you know, I mean, the yeah. So the list goes on and on, right? Because I'm a fan of yeah. all of them, man. I mean, let's just be honest. Yeah. So you can tell I'm struggling trying to pick my my favorite. Yeah, that's right? what I'm pulling um, for this year. It would be Bender and Martin. I think Bender's in second. I think at the moment. Yeah. yeah so yeah, I think so. Yeah. That'd probably yeah. be my favorites in uh, GP this year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, I'm always pulling for the back markers to pull off something, but of course. realistically, for a championship, I think yeah. Martin, 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 or Martin, Bender yeah. is going to be the go to. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. It's going to be a great season, man. It's uh, absolutely. So let me ask you this uh, if you could bring any three people to dinner with you, dead or alive, who, who would you bring? They could be celebrities, they could be anybody, family members, whoever it is, racers. Yeah, I think, I think it, well, it would be family members, of course, but uh, outside of just being able to spend time with people in my family, um, I think Shane would be a good one. I think Terrence McKenna, uh, another philosopher, um, and Jesus. I think I'd like to. I'd like to hang out with Jesus for a little bit. Um, so I think that'll. I think that'll do it. That'd be a good dinner. Uh, dude, Paul, it was funny because I, I had uh, – I'm trying to remember who it was. I asked him the same question, and he was like, 
Valentina Rossi and Mark Marquez. And I was like, bro, that would be an epic like dinner conversation right there, right? Yeah. Like uh, Yeah, I was watching 2013. Uh, you know, I'm going back through the, yeah. the archives of MotoGP. So 2013 just started and I got to saw, uh, see Marquez's first victory. I think it was the second race yeah. of the season. So Yeah, it's uh coming coming in fire. Yeah, he's a. Uh, I'm pulling for him this year. Actually, I take that back. Since he's old school, if Marquez could pull it out, it's it's strange. I know you know as a Rossi fan, it's strange to be pulling for Marquez because he was like the guy that used to enjoy pulling against. But not now. I got to pull for him. I just have to. Yeah. Uh, it's like the comeback story, man. It's great, dude. Listen, I, I'm, I'm with you, man. I used to cannot stand like I, dude. I don't use the word hate. I think hate's like one of the worst words anybody can use. I don't care what you're talking about. Hate is just such a uh, one of the most negative words you you can use, in my opinion. Okay, so yeah, I used to dislike Marquez a lot. I used to dislike Jorge Lorenzo. Everybody knows I'm big into like Greek mythology and the Spartans and all that, right? So in in the uh, and the Egyptians and the pyramids and all that, right? But when Jorge Lorenzo came out with that Spartan on his helmet, I was like, okay. From the background, I would never confess it to any of my friends because, of course, I'd be made fun of. I was like, I, I, I like, I like Lorenzo a little bit like this because it's Spartan. How can you not? You, you, you found a way into my heart. Okay. As far as Marquez goes, bro, absolutely, the trials and tribulations that he has gone through uh, to make it and come back, just the sure determinations when. 99.9% of everybody else that went through that shit would have quit or retired. That's just a fact. Um, but to have him still be a vector and still have the same determination. Um, yeah. It, it, who wouldn't, I would love to see Marquez win the title this year. I don't think it's going to happen. Will he win some races? I really hope so. I think Cotto, I'll be out there in April next month. Can't wait. Hopefully that's going to, he'll do it there. Right. But Alex Rands won there last year on the Honda. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's where he won the set. His first race was in America. Was that at Coda or was it a Laguna? I, I can't remember, but Coda. it was. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolute Coda, man. Yeah, that'd Absolutely. be a dream to go out there. I hadn't made it to Coda yet, but that's. Dude, you need that's to. On the, it's on the books here soon. Oh, good, good. Because well, I'll meet you out there for sure. Yeah, you can be oh. in Atlanta coming up for Moto America, though, right? Yeah. Are you coming? I'll be there. Bro, I can't wait. Yes, it's going to be a good time. Yep. Absolutely. So. Let me ask you this, Paul. Uh, what's life after racing? Kayaking down a river. Um, grilling out. Playing with the dogs. Just easy living, man. You know, go go trail, riding. Um, enjoy nature. Uh, riding is where my motivation sits for my immobile years. So I have a lot of things that i've prepped and prepared and notes that i've taken over the years and eventually the end goal is to coalesce my thoughts and imagination into books writing so that will be that's the next goal is to accomplish publishing things that i feel can be a benefit to others whether it be through tale or just a regaling of my own personal experience and how that helped change my life for the better. So God gave me a story. All I got to do is just put it on paper. And outside of that, um, I would like to say, just find a, a nice, peaceful, serene place to, to end my days and live out fishing or kayaking or just enjoying the sunset, man. Just living life. Watch and racing. Watch and racing. Watching I'll racing. always watch. In fact, I would like to finance a team. I mean, eventually I would like to be a team owner. That would be, I think for most racers, that's kind of, if you can't be racing, you want to put someone on your bike or on a bike and be able to, you know, kind of vicariously live through them, but also help them to reach their dreams. It's yeah. like you you're a perfect conduit for people to be able to, and especially if you, if it did good for your life, if it made you a happier, better person, then I think you sh should almost be compelled to want to pass on that lineage and that knowledge if you can. So for me, if I can pull up off the river on a Thursday and head down to the track on Friday and get my rider set up and, you know, be promoting 
him, her, or the team and get, get that going, I think that would be the ultimate dream. I mean, if my last day can be uh, pulling up off the dock, heading to the racetrack, and then passing away as my racer wins a race, then that's, that, don't sound, that don't sound too bad. No, absolutely not, dude. A- absolutely not. Dial Brinkley in the house. What is up, buddy? Um, dude, listen, Paul. This has been absolutely amazing. I had a great time. I hope you did too. Matter of fact, I don't even know why I said that. I already know you did, right? So, the best, yeah, dude, the best. absolutely, man. Listen, it's again, it's an absolute honor to have you on the podcast. Before I end this, I need you to give all your shouts out. How can people find you on social media, follow you, donate, help you out in your racer? All right. I got a plan. All right. So, let me do my, my sponsors. I was, I'm just going to show a couple of these. Chef Eats, we already discussed that. You know, 1X, Tulio 1X, fantastic suits. Uh, you know, there's a lot of good companies out there, but for me, 1X has been fantastic, and um, I've never felt more comfortable in a suit. So, O'Neill, they've been they've been helpful this year. Um, Forma Boots, thank you, Forma Boots. How do you like the form of boots? I'm still breaking mine in. It's awesome. The protection feels unparalleled, and it opens up on the calf, which I've got a larger calf, so I've kind of had some trouble with that. So it allows for a little bit more of the um, the room in the calf area. And once you get that thing buckled down, I mean, it took me a little bit to get used to it because it's a little more formative, a little more um, bulky than my previous boot but that's because it's like a tank i mean i'm pretty sure if i go down the boots will also if there's nothing left of me the boots will still be there so i got no complaints thus far and they look great so um all right we got a couple more let's see this is super bike supply they're um they're getting things going they're they're supporting some riders and they've been helpful this year and we're one of the first sponsors to come on board eric uh, he's the owner, uh, and he's a racer as well. So I would suggest at least talking to him if you're looking at getting some parts there. Just good good racers who have put together um, a company and are now giving back, um, especially for me. They I say they came on early and helped out, and definitely want to say thanks to them. And Spears Racing, Greg in California, super guy. He does – specializes in the smaller bikes so if you've got you know the 400 the 300 all of the smaller and he's i think he just got a 500 in so he's going to start modding stuff out but he's got custom parts for everything and he's been very helpful as well so that's and then let me this is this is my best friend here in town the guy that i got started riding with brit pest control it's my buddy seth brit the r6 so if you're here in town, you need some pest control. That's my best friend and ain't a harder worker out there. So, and if you want to do a sponsorship, this is a, that might work, but if you scan that, that will take you to a sponsorship video, which I prepared for sponsors. Um, so if you know, if anyone out there is looking for an opportunity to get on a bike or on a suit helmet all the all the stuff if you want a a different way to advertise besides the um, little league baseball fields then you can scan that or if racers just kind of want to got to get an idea of how the club racer should approach getting a sponsorship that is what i sent to most of the sponsors um if not all uh and had a fairly good response so it's it's a YouTube link that will take you to a video that will break down basically my career. And then at the end, it breaks down what you get as a sponsor and how much each tier costs. And I would suggest at least something like that, because um, as most racers know now, it's very difficult to get sponsorship. So the more polished, if you send in just a piece of paper, that's you're going to you're going to have a difficult it's going to be difficult to stand out because they're getting lots and lots of emails all the time. So I would suggest if no one, if you have never tried to do it, that's at least a framework to give you an idea of what worked for me. Now you can't promise that for everyone, but it was, I put in the hours for that and it paid off. And 
Facebook, Paul McKee 29, Instagram, Paul McKee 29. So if you do Paul McKee Racing in Google, you'll probably get stuff. Absolutely, dude. That was great. Absolutely. And before I get off here, I got to give a shout out. Man, I really need to sit down and, and write out my shout out list, Paul. But I feel like if I did, it'd be like at least 10 minutes long, right? Yada, 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 yada. But listen, you guys know who you are. I love all you guys so much. It's an absolute honor. I want to give a big shout out to my man Jake Marsh over there in G at British Superbikes in the GP2 class. Um, he has a club called Club 45. Go sign up and, and help him out. He's a super mega fast guy coming up. And uh yeah, he's gonna be absolutely amazing. Another shout out is my man Julian Carrera in the British Talent Cup. You guys know who yep. he is already, right? Yeah. So listen, he's got some slots available still at Club 40. So go over there, join up for Club 40 and help him out too. An amazing kid. It's gonna be it's not going to be. He is already super fast. So nothing but love and support for those guys. Big shout out to my man, Martin, at the clothingkings.co.uk. You can go there and get all your pen to gas merch. Um, yeah, we got hats, soft shell jackets, all that good stuff. Um, dude, am I forgetting? Dude, Jeff Eats. Big shout out to my man, Jeff Eats. and uh, Jeff Eats. <laughs> Jeff Eats. Sorry. <laughs> right? Uh, Jeff Serving. Get in touch with him, man. Some of the best meals you can get absolutely deliver to your door you'll absolutely listen just I'm, I'm done talking about it just go order some you can thank me and paul when you see us in yeah. person yeah just bill us if you don't like it just yeah just bill us yeah and, and send us the leftovers because we'll absolutely <laughs> eat them for sure. That's right. box it back up put the ice packs back in there just uh, i'll take care of it I got absolutely we got you we got you but yes again thank you guys so much nothing but love to every single one of you guys it's been an absolute honor an absolute pleasure to be able to sit here and, and do this and uh yeah thank you guys so much but uh, you guys see this beautiful face tomorrow stay tuned because i got my man mike smith coming on from british super bikes he races the bmw f900 cup super excited met him out there at cadwell been looking forward to that one too but yes listen i'm gonna get off here i'm gonna go eat paul's gonna go eat right you're gonna go right. eat too right That's paul right. yeah it's absolutely all that, all that talk man That's right so Absolutely. But yes, listen, guys, thank you so much. And I will see you tomorrow. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Dude, that's absolutely.